welcome to Flourishment, the podcast on living life as you were meant to, so you can flourish. I am so thrilled today to have Erica Wiggenhorn as my special guest. She is a Bible study teacher of Bible study teachers. She's also an author with Moody Publishers of multiple women's Bible studies, and she's an expert in mentoring. She's come here today to talk about pair power. Welcome, Erica, to Flourishment. Thank you, Tina. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today talking about something that is truly one of my passions. I can tell from your history of working with women who are in transitional ministries and prison ministries, as well as general women's ministries, you have a lot of experience in mentoring women, and you know a lot about pair power, how to find those kinds of friendships that optimize our lives. Is there something in your personal history that makes you particularly passionate about helping women find those friendships that are going to be meaningful and help us grow? Absolutely. I would not be the person that I am today uh, without uh, those beautiful and godly mentors that God graciously brought into my life. I would certainly not be writing Bible studies. I definitely would not be standing up on stages speaking uh, without their encouragement and their pouring into me and their speaking life into me. And honestly, Tina, I think that this is really the example that we see in scripture of how our giftedness is communicated to us, revealed to us, and how it becomes strengthened so that we can use it to help build the kingdom. What was your first experience with a friend who came alongside you and served as a mentor in your life? One of my earliest experiences that I can remember of someone that really just intentionally took me under their wing was when I was pretty early in my career at that point. I was an elementary school teacher. My husband was uh, in school full time, uh, very grueling. He was in medical school. And so teaching was really my life at that point. Um, I just poured everything into it. I loved it. And I had an older woman who had been uh, in teaching for years. And she really came alongside of me and said, you know, you, you have the gift of a teacher and I really want to help you foster that. And she began to open up doors for me of opportunity to begin uh, having other teachers come into my classroom to begin sharing with other teachers uh, what I was doing, how I was experience, experiencing success with uh, some of my struggling students, especially uh, second language learners. Those were really uh, the students that had just really captured my heart. And um, I can look back on that now and see how God used her and used that season to prepare me to now begin teaching his word to other adults. But at the time, you know, I could only imagine myself standing in front of children, not other women uh, teaching them. So your experience with mentoring was part of God helping you develop your calling not just a discipleship experience, but it was very targeted for what God had called you to do to help you to do it in the way that you didn't understand was possible. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that I see a lot in the women that I minister to now is they, um, not only do they battle with a sense of loneliness, but they battle with a sense of not really knowing exactly where they fit. They don't really know, you know, what their giftedness is. They don't really even necessarily know what their calling is or feel as though they have any type of calling in the church or in ministry. And 
I think a big reason why is because God generally, from what I see in scripture and, you know, from my life experience, God doesn't generally issue our callings to us personally. Our salvation is personal, but our calling is communal. And generally God issues those callings upon people's lives through other people, right? We see this. We see uh, we see God uh, calling Elisha through Elijah. We see God calling Joshua through Moses. You know, Moses is one of the very few people that God directly placed a call on. We see God's calling upon Paul to the Gentiles um, when the whole church was gathered together in Acts 13. And so I think one of the reasons why we struggle so much in understanding uh, who we are, where we don't feel like we're flourishing, if you will, is because we just don't have those people speaking into our lives. So it's so important to have someone alongside you that can not just identify that calling, but help you to grow and develop that calling. How do we find people that are qualified to help us identify our calling? Because not everyone is able to do that. Absolutely. And that is a question that I get often is, well, where do I find these people? You know, and honestly, the first and foremost thing is, is be intentional about praying for them. You know, be intentional about asking God to send these people into your life. And then secondly, we have to be intentional about opening ourselves up to meet these people. Um, I remember as a young mom, you know, I had two little kids. We had just moved across the country. I didn't really know anybody. My Mother lived far away. I was trying to figure out this whole motherhood season. I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember asking God to send older women into my life in my community. And one of the simple ways that he did that was I wanted to serve somewhere at church. Um, obviously with two little kids and a husband who was never home, that was tough. And so I thought, well, where could I serve? And so I signed up for the prayer team at church and one Sunday a month or possibly two, I would sit in this little tiny cubby hole of a room with two other women uh, who were much older than I was at the time. They had grandchildren and we would just pray together during the service while it was happening. And these women were incredible prayer warriors and they taught me how to pray. But the second thing that God did through that was anytime I had a prayer request for that season of my life, whether it be in motherhood or my marriage, um, you know, transitioning to a new place, I knew these women were mighty warriors of prayer. And so that's just a super simple example of, you know, this is how we connect with these women is if we are intentionally connecting in our churches uh, and praying and asking God to send them, I believe he'll be faithful to do that because he desires that for us. This isn't something that we want. And God's kind of like, yeah, yeah, I guess so. You know, this is God's design. And so it's something that he wants for us as, as much, if not more so than we want it for ourselves. How do you know when someone is a good fit for you as a mentor? One of the things that I think is, it has to be somebody that you are going to be willing to listen to. If it's somebody that your attitude is, is you're looking at them and you're thinking, well, they don't really get it. And, you know, they don't understand. And I get that they're trying to give me advice, but it's not really relevant. That's not going to be a good fit because you're going to just resist everything that they're saying. And if you find yourself with that attitude towards a lot of people, then it's probably not so much that they aren't able to mentor you as much as you are not willing to be mentored. If I could just 
tell a little truth there for a minute. Um, but one of the things is, do you look at their life and say to yourself, I want to be like that in 10 years or in 20 years? That is a person that you want speaking into your life. Um, another thing that you really want to look for is um, if you have a mentor or someone who is speaking into your life, if you do not do exactly what they tell you to do. Uh, how do they respond to that? Do they respond to that with anger? Do they respond to that by um, becoming sort of passive aggressive with you? Or do they respond to that in a gracious way, basically pressing back into you and saying, now help me to understand why you didn't, why did you decide not to listen to my advice. Why, what were you feeling? What were you thinking that led you to go down a different path? In other words, it's not about them. It's about you as the one that they're mentoring and their heart's desire is to really understand what's going on with you and understanding um, how your choices are driven and how to best speak truth into your life. They're not going to take everything personally. I like that. That's very helpful to understand some of the qualities of the mentor and the attitudes of your own heart to be paying attention to before you enter into a relationship with someone that's going to be an optimizing friendship for you. Mm -hmm. So what about the difference between some similar models of helping us become our best? There's discipleship, there's coaching, and there's mentoring. And there are some subtle differences between those. Can you tease that out for us so the audience can understand that a little better? Sure. I think ultimately what we really need to ask ourselves is if we are going to invest the time in building a relationship and let some letting someone uh, speak into our lives and we are going to ask that other person to give up their valuable time and their life, you know, share their life experience and their wisdom. What is the ultimate goal that we're looking for out of this relationship? If we're looking for um, spiritual growth, right? If that is all, if that is the essence of what our goal is, um, the biggest goal, we, I think you have to prioritize them to some degree. If that's your biggest goal, um, then discipleship is really the model that, that you're looking for. You're looking for someone who has figured out how to follow Jesus um, a little more consistently, a little more fervently, uh, maybe with a little uh, less fear, uh, some greater obedience than you have. That is a discipleship model. If you're looking at something where um, you are investing in this relationship because you maybe you have the same call. So for instance, uh, I have women in my life that are authors and they are speakers and they don't necessarily disciple me in my spiritual growth, but they mentor me in what it looks like to be a woman who is an author who follows Jesus. So my goal in that relationship is to figure out what my calling looks like as someone who's done it a little bit longer than I have. How do they balance um, traveling with their marriage and their family? How do they balance, um, you know, difficult uh, rejection when you are so certain that God called you to write a book and nobody wants to publish it? You know, that's more of a mentoring type uh, relationship where there is a similarity of call or a similarity of goal setting, and they're helping you kind of take that next step. Uh, coaching, I think, really has a lot more to do with someone who's maybe not a hundred percent sure where they want to go or what it all looks like or the steps. Uh, that they need to take to get there. So this is a person who's going to more um, kind of lead you on a process of self-discovery. You don't even necessarily 100% know what you're asking at this point. 
So I think what we have to really start with is um, where are we at and what is our ultimate goal uh, for this relationship? And that's really going to determine um, what the relationship looks like. Uh, in a mentoring relationship, I know the advice that I'm looking for. I know what I'm needing. And so I'm going to that mentor with those specific questions. Uh, whereas in a coaching relationship, maybe I just feel stuck or I'm not sure what the next step is, or I'm not sure uh, which way to go. And I need somebody to kind of guide me in um, allowing God to reveal what his plan is. And a coaching relationship feels more like a professional relationship. Mm -hmm. A mentoring relationship is more of a friendship, a personal relationship, wouldn't you say? I would say that. I think that you can end up really developing good friendships with your coaches. Um, but I do think that, you know, like you said, it, it's generally a coach is someone that you pay, right? You're paying them money uh, to to influence you with their um with their discovery style that they have invested uh, time and education and money in order to be certified in how to do. So I do think it is more professional. There's a different boundary there. Um, but I do think your coach can end up becoming a good friend over time. Um, but it is, it is less intimate in a lot of ways. Yes. From your experience in developing successful mentoring relationships, what are some tips on things that we should do and some tips on things that we should not do? <laughs> Great question. Well, first I'll, I'll start with the mentee. That's the person who is seeking out the mentor. First of all, be teachable. You need to realize that this is a person who has willingly and readily chosen to invest in you. So you need to be teachable. Generally, people that are willing to give up their time and pour into other people are um, pretty amazing people. <laughs> and so, you know, be grateful. Be grateful that this person is willing to speak into your life. The second thing that I would say is be intentional with everything that they tell you. Take it back to scripture and take it back to God uh, for confirmation. Uh, don't elevate your mentor and their wisdom above God's wisdom. And when you see a discrepancy or you think to yourself, you know, there's just something within me that that just doesn't sit right. Have an honest conversation with your mentor about it. Um, that, you know, I, I'm really struggling with that advice. Um, I, I can't reconcile it with uh, what I've learned in scripture. Um, there's just something about it that's not sitting well within me. Can we dive a little deeper into this and figure out um, where that, you know, where that reticence is coming from? Um, so, Communicate and don't, you know, don't elevate your mentor above God. Now, for the mentor, what I would say is realize that uh, ultimately you are to give advice, um, but you're also to give grace. I mean, as a mentor, at the end of the day, what we are to be to the person that we are mentoring is to be like Christ, to show them what Christ likeness is about. And so, you know, we're told in John that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth, right? So um, sometimes I think when we get into that mentoring relationship, we get really focused on telling the truth. You know, I'm just going to tell them like it is. I'm going to tell them the truth because I'm the older and wiser one and they've sought me out. And yes, absolutely tell the truth. <laughs> but also realize that we're because we're called to be like Christ, that truth has to be equally balanced with grace. And that kind of goes back to, um, you know, the mentee as well to realize, you know, don't expect your mentor to only be grace to you. You have invited them to speak truth into your life. And sometimes 
the truth stinks, right? Sometimes the truth hurts and we need to be honest that, you know what, sometimes our mentor is going to say things that we don't want to hear. Um, but but that's why we have them in our life is to open our eyes to some of those things that we've chosen to ignore and God is wanting to address. Would you say that if a mentor isn't challenging you, maybe it's time to find a new mentor? I would, because if your mentor isn't challenging you, then they're not mentoring you. They're just your friend. Um, a mentor should be challenging you. A mentor should be speaking uh, truth into your life. They should be challenging you in your priorities. They should be presenting you with questions uh, that are heart checks. Uh, they should be pointing you to the truth. Uh, one of my uh, mentors, you know, anytime I meet with her, the very first thing that she says to me is, how is your marriage and how are your children? That's a mentoring question. You know, she's not asking me that as my friend. She's asking me that as someone who's saying, you have a very busy life. You have an intense calling and you need to make sure that you're keeping your relationship with God first, your marriage second, and your relationship with your children third. And my job as your mentor is to make sure that that never gets out of whack. And so absolutely, if your mentor is not ever asking a hard question, that's not a mentor, that's a cheerleader. Mm, that's really great. I love that you've given us those very practical, very concrete and clear examples of what we should and should not be expecting from those relationships. Do you find that our mentoring relationships can change over time? Perhaps you outgrow the space that in which you needed a specific mentor and you need a different mentor, not because they're not challenging you be, because of some fault of theirs, but because you just simply have gone to a different place or your calling has changed. I do think that that is true. I mean, especially if your calling has changed, uh, you're going to need a mentor that can speak into that particular calling. You know, I mentioned one of my first mentors when I was working as an elementary school teacher. Obviously, when I was no longer doing that job, um, that mentorship changed. It wasn't that we didn't have a good relationship anymore, but I didn't need a mentor on how to better become, a, you know, better become a better teacher because it was no longer teaching in the classroom. And so there definitely is those shifts in, um, uh, in season. I think this is why even once you have a mentor, Tina, it's so important to continually be opening yourself up to new relationships all the time. Um, because you just don't know, um, when your call will change or when God will reveal the next step to you. You know, I mentioned uh, the two sweet ladies that were uh, in the prayer room with me and they became wonderful mentors in my life for that season as a very young mom. But at the same time, God opened the door for another woman who didn't even go to our church, but she was one of my neighbors and she became a mentor in my life. She lived down the street and um, she was really the one that God used to challenge me to start leading my very first Bible study. And again, it was a situation where uh, she was hosting a brunch for all the women in the neighborhood. Uh, I didn't know anybody. A lot of the women were older than me. I wasn't, you know, I really had to scramble to find a place for my kids to go uh, so that I was able to make it to this brunch. Uh, it was, you know, I felt uncomfortable walking in, uh, but it ended up being a beautiful mentoring relationship that eventually now has developed into a friendship. Um, but again, you know, I could have said, well, I have these two sweet ladies over here mentoring me. I don't need to open myself up to more relationships with uh, other women. But because I did, God brought the next mentor, a different type of mentor for that next calling in that next season that was going to begin within the following year. So 
We can't pigeonhole ourselves with one mentor and think, okay, this is it. I found the one. We're going all the way to glory together and I don't need to meet anybody else. That's great. I think that's so important that we keep the Holy Spirit's guidance as central in all of our relationships, especially with mentoring, because there can be that shift from becoming a mentee, someone who's got a mentor, to also becoming someone who has the opportunity to mentor others. And the Holy Spirit has to guide you into that position as well, making sure that you have listened to him about whether to adopt someone in your life as a mentor as well. So for someone that is being called into that relationship from being mentored and continuing to be mentored, I hope, into becoming a mentor, what are some self-care and some important tips for that person as they begin that process of being a mentor? That's a great question. And, you know, one of the things, even when we talk about mentoring, I think is so important is that, you know, a lot of us sort of have these, this, you know, preconceived notion of what mentoring uh, needs to look like, right? And, you know, a lot of times it's just, it's just being available uh, to those around us. It doesn't even necessarily have to be this uh, extremely set thing that's happening. Um, I, I can give you a perfect example. Uh, my son, he is in middle school and one of his little friends at school uh, had to do an essay and she didn't really have anyone at home that could help her with it. And she just texted me and said, um, would, would you mind if I came over and you looked over my essay and you gave me some tips? So here I am, you know, I'm mentoring this sweet little young teen in her writing for school. I'm mentoring her, but that doesn't mean that, you know, she's going to come over every Sunday and we're going to have this deep discussion or grammar lesson. It's just being available to those around us. And so a lot of times, you know, I can look back on my life and I'm sure you can too, that there were just sort of these very unexpected teachable moments where you were either sitting around a table at Bible study or you were working together on some sort of service team or you were at a conference and somebody said something to you or spoke something into your life and it just became kind of this little nugget, this little gem of truth that you tucked into your pocket that every now and again, when certain circumstances arise, you can reach down into that, that pocket of your memory and you can just sort of finger that jewel and be reminded of the truth that was spoken over you at that point. And I think, honestly, rather than always trying to uh, create this sort of uh, checklist or a box of what a mentoring relationship looks like, I really think what God is mostly calling us to do is just be women that are available and women that listen well enough and know our word well enough to be able to speak truth and encouragement and hope and grace into another woman's life when we have the opportunity to rub shoulders with her, even if it's for a few minutes. To me, that is the call of all of us. It's the call of mentoring, right? To bring the person next to us up a little higher. But the other thing, if you know, if we are going to really enter into this, you know, unique relationship where we're regularly meeting and we've committed to that, um, some of the things that, you know, are going to be really important are setting some boundaries. When I was mentoring in transitional type ministry, a young woman who had recently come out of prison, um, you know, it was a it's a very volatile time in her life. And so without proper boundaries, you know, you can get phone calls in the middle of the night. I'm so struggling. I'm, you know, um, so you've got to figure out some boundaries. And if you you know, have um, 
a husband who needs a decent night's sleep for his work, or you have kids you've got to take care of, or a job you've got to do, you know, you're going to have to set some boundaries like, you know, I am here for you and you can definitely text me a prayer request, but please don't call me, you know, after five o'clock on weekdays because that's my time with my family. We have to set some healthy boundaries. It's not like um, you are this person's servant and every minute they're having a crisis, you need to be immediately right there. Um, that's not healthy for you and it's not healthy for them because essentially what the message is that you're giving that person that you're mentoring at that point is that they are unable to cope without you. And that's not a healthy relationship. And that's not what we want to be teaching anyone. That's really good. And I love that you're saying a mentor needs to be someone who's listening and in tune with the Holy Spirit. So as mentors, we need mentors and we need to be aligned with the Holy Spirit through scripture and regular prayer and making sure that we're healthy spiritually so that we can be that person who provides the wisdom given to us from God to somebody, not just something we're pulling out of our own head. So I love that. I love that you come and brought all this wisdom today, Erica. And I want people to be able to find your Bible studies so they can get grounded in the word as people who need mentoring or people who are mentors that need to get deeper in scripture. So how can people follow you, uh, access you for speaking engagements or find your Bible studies? Where can they connect with you? Uh, the easiest place to connect with me is on my website. It's just my name. It's Erica, E-R-I-C-A, Wigginhorn. That's a mouthful, so I'll spell it for you. Uh, W-I-G-G-E-N-H-O-R-N. Uh, so it's just like it sounds, but it's EricaWigginhorn.com, and you can find um all my social media links on there. You can... Uh, Take a look at different uh, speaking topics that I've addressed and uh, all of the studies that I've written. You have a new one that just came out. Uh, my latest one was just released a couple of months ago. It's called Unexplainable Jesus, Rediscovering the God You Thought You Knew. And it covers the Gospel of Luke. And it was actually born in my heart, Tina, during... Uh, my trip to Israel when we had a Jewish tour guide and he was explaining um, how Jesus taught uh, from a Jewish perspective and all of his figures of speech. And, you know, we're standing along the shores of the Sea of Galilee and seeing it all in living color. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, how I wish every follower of Jesus could be taught these things and have this experience. And so it was really, uh, really an answer to my prayer. But I feel like I fell in love with Jesus all over again. I finally understood all the things that I never un quite got what Jesus meant when he was talking about having a good eye and a bad eye and, uh, you know, a, a bushel and uh, mustard seed and, you know, all these things that I'd never uh, seen before uh, came alive. And uh, it just made me realize, you know, you want to talk about mentoring, coaching, discipling. I mean, Jesus was perfection in all of those roles. So. Wow, that sounds so rich and so filled with wonderful things. I cannot wait to get my hands on it. So I'm glad that you told us about your website. So everyone listening will be able to access that amazing nugget of gold. Thank you so much for coming on Flourishment today, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. And I sure pray that uh, God continues to bless you and bless this ministry and bless the women that are listening who so desire to, uh, you know, not live ho-hum lives, but to really flourish uh, in, in their corner of the world and in the roles and responsibilities and callings that God has issued upon them. And I, sure, I just want to quickly pray a, just a prayer of blessing that God would direct you to those women and to those men who can speak 
into your life and encourage you to follow Jesus with all of your heart and pursue the calling, those dreams that he has put inside of you for his glory, um, that you can be a world changer for, for the kingdom of God. Wow. Amen. And I praise you and thank you, Father God, for Erica. And I pray that all those who are listening will continue to follow up with Erica and stay connected with her. Thank you, Erica. And thank you for listening. And may you all come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Mm -hmm.